I think that having realized that core fear at such a young age, being unwanted and unloved and being abandoned and harmed by those that brought me into this world, my mom, I've never, up until about 10 years ago, never knew anything different than that. It hurts a lot to know that that my flesh and blood didn't want me. And then fast forward into my 20s, my husband didn't want me. Hey guys, thank you so much for coming back to the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. You are in episode two of a nine-part series on the Enneagram and trauma and how we are helping ourselves understand and process our trauma based on the way we're made using the framework of the Enneagram. Today, you're in for a treat as the switch has been flipped and Chrissy interviews me. It was quite terrifying, if I'm being honest, but there is rawness, there is realness, there are tears, but most of all, there is the highlighting of the star of the story, who is Jesus. While you're at it, head over to the Patreon account where we are providing free content called AC Chat, which is a further conversation after these interviews that Chrissy and I are doing together with the nine Enneagram types. But for now, let's drop into this conversation where Chrissy interviews me, type two. Enneagram, the helper. So today is a special day, and I have mentioned many times that those of you who may identify as an Enneagram 2 would be in for a special treat. And so today we are flipping the switch a little bit, and since I am representing the two, Chrissy, my co-host, is going to interview me, which should make life interesting. So welcome back to the show, Chrissy Lothridge. It's good to be here. I'm excited about today. Um, I think this is going to be a really, really good interview. Yeah, and I'm so, so excited to have you sitting here beside me. So let's just jump right in here. We've been doing this to everybody else. I can't not say that I am excited about this part, but let's go. What is the your favorite thing about the way God made you? You know, I wrote this question and I hate it. Um, what is my favorite thing about the way God made me? And so it's very difficult to not say the things that I can do or whatever, but because that's the way I've always identified myself. But I think after having asked this question eight times to other Enneagram types and evaluating it myself, I think my favorite thing about how God made me is how outgoing I am, how great I am. And honestly, I love my Enneagram 2 I love, even though it's hard to be as empathetic as I am, I love having a heart for people. Not that everybody doesn't have that. But it, when I see an ambulance on the road, my first thought is, dear Lord, please help the people that are in that, that accident. And I just love that even though so many things tried to break me, that that thing that God gave me is still here. So I think that's the way I would answer that question. Yeah, I love that. And I agree. I mean, it, it is, it is such a gift to, to really, um, it's, it's a gift to get to do life with you. And I sense that I feel that every day when, um, sometimes you will actually take on the burdens of things outside of what we call your range. Um, because you are so uh, empathetic and you're a helper. And so it may be the world's problems that you're taking on. And um, it's good for me to have that perspective because I hone in on my little village too much sometimes. Yeah. And, and I know sometimes it might drive you a little bit crazy, but but it is my favorite thing about how God made me. And really because I get to do this. I get to get behind microphones and podiums and keyboards and help people. So I am really grateful for that. And I am grateful for people like you and my community who kind of keep me in my lane because I know that can be hard sometimes. Well, I kind of want to dig right in. And this is a question I have for you. The core fear, as I understand it, of the Enneagram 2 is abandonment. And the core longing is to be loved. And the story the Lord has told in your life is exactly that. So 
So tell me, how how do you walk that? Yeah, um, sorry for the tears because they were going to come. Um, you know, I just, I think that having realized that core fear at such a young age, being unwanted and unloved and being abandoned and harmed by those that brought me into this world, my mom, I've never, up until about 10 years ago, never knew anything different than that. And I didn't know, and I still don't know how to walk that out with God. It is something that I'm working with now. But I'll tell you the way that right now that I'm, I am dealing with it is just leaning into the pain instead of doing what I have done for so long. And it hurts a lot to know that, that my flesh and blood didn't want me. And then fast forward into my 20s, my husband didn't want me. And so I think the answer to your question is day by day. I have a friend of mine who who says strength for each moment, grace for each day. And so as I'm walking in my journey now of healing and trying to understand and trying to really indict God, like you made me this way, you made me with this fear of being unwanted and loved, and then you did it. And there's something very powerful about sitting in that tension. And so I think the answer to your question is to be continued. You know, the, a huge part of me being um lover of justice is indeed ma- mad at God. Uh, if, if you made Amy this way, why would you do the very thing that would be the worst? And yet, that is part of what makes God's... Uh, abundant love, abundant grace, abundant healing, obvious. This is worst case scenario Mm -hmm. for me. And, and here the Lord has, has taken what is so, what is the worst and is redeeming it. That does not mean that you wake up in the morning and everything is great. It means that day by day, he is telling a beautiful story it is beauty from ashes yeah and I I don't always see it that way um yeah I, I pour myself into this work this podcast and and other things and I I don't always see the beauty from ashes I've often referred to myself as a spoil of war like okay God you just keep throwing it at me and not not throw it at everybody else but one thing that I have learned, and particularly through Enneagram work, and again, I don't think that the Enneagram is the end all, but I think when it's when it's paired with a gospel-centered truth, like has been happening with me in Enneagram coaching, is this this idea that he both loves me and chose me, frankly, to go through some of the things that I've gone through. And I think of... of the man at, at the healing pool where he just wouldn't get in the pool and wouldn't get in the pool because probably because he was mad at God. And for a long time, I didn't get in the healing pool. And now I'm there and I'm using the framework of the Enneagram. And so I'm able to say to my friends, I'm able to say to you, hey, I just need to feel loved. I need to feel wanted. And I need it to be because I woke up, not because of what I provide. And my community does a great job of that for me. So my next question is, um, for for the Enneagram 2s out there, how do you walk through the daily stresses and then traumas that happen to all of us aside from your, your past? Do you have any practical tips, things that you've noticed that you've gotten better at or that the Lord has helped you, um, tools and tips types of thing? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, particularly for those Enneagram twos out there who have experienced trauma. And so practically speaking, I have found since I started paying attention, and I think that's why we're doing this series is to help people understand, like pay attention to how God made you and therefore you can almost custom fit, if you will, a healing plan that is for you. And so on on the daily, and this does happen to me every day, while I might not recognize 
this core fear of mainly being unwanted because I feel pretty loved, but mainly being unwanted. I have to be very, very diligent about keeping people around me, number one, that will call me out on it and say, look, you are trying to prove your worth to the world by things that you're doing. And you are worthy and you are loved because you woke up this morning because God created you in his own image. And so that would be the first thing I would say, practically speaking, is having people around me that will sometimes recognize what I don't even recognize, which is really common in trauma. I think, Chrissy, one of the things that you do really well is some some mornings I will wake up and we live right next door to each other and we're business partners, so lots of reason for morning interaction. And sometimes you can just look at me and say, okay, what's wrong? And and then be able to talk that out. I think that Enneagram coaching has been huge for me. And so I know that not everyone can afford that, but it's one of the reasons why we are doing this deep dive is to to understand what would it look like if I allow God to care for me? And that's a question that I learned in Enneagram coaching that I ask every day. You know, and finally, Chrissy, I think that, and really this is last and certainly not least, but paramount, Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. And so as a trauma survivor who sits in a strong Enneagram too with that that desire to be wanted and to be loved and to really do anything to make that happen, I know that on any given day as I walk through the everyday traumas plus the stuff that already happened to me, if I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, all of these things will be added unto me. And when I think of all, one of the things that I think of the most is peace, the peace that passes all understanding. I often quote Isaiah 26, 3, where the Bible says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And then Psalm 43, where he promises to walk with us through everything that I've been through. And so those are the practical answers to that question, Chrissy, of how on the daily, basically understanding the way God made me and my and, and the blueprint of how he made me in Psalm 139 plus trauma. This is how I mostly get through every day. Tell me some unhealthy ways that you walk through your day. You've just t- told us, you know, the, the, the good ways, the healthy ways to walk through stress and trauma. Talk to us about the unhealthy ways. Going for the juggler, are we, Chrissy Lothridge? Wow. Some unhealthy ways. Well, there are many. They are many. You, when you think about the core fear of being unwanted or unloved, and then you think about that fear having been realized in trauma like, like mine has, if I can't stay with the things that I just mentioned to you, then I will spiral. And that used to exhibit itself in attention-seeking behavior. Like I would go on Facebook and go, I stubbed my toe, everybody pray for me. When I realized that that wasn't cool and that that's not what people wanted, I now find myself quite the opposite where I will completely shut down. I will go into a dark room with a sad documentary, something that would expel tears from my eyes, because at that moment I am feeling both unwanted and unloved and am coming up empty when I ask that question, how can I allow God to care for me? And so I have a fire escape plan for that. And it's a four-hour fire escape plan. And basically when my DVD, DVR receiver in my room tells me, hey, you've been inactive for four hours, would you like for me to turn it off? I make myself get up. Normally, I will reach out to a friend at that point and won't say, hey, I need you or I'm feeling unwanted or unloved. But I may be intentional about reaching out to someone who will make me feel both of those things. And then finally, I will land in the war room with lots of tears and explaining to God how I felt unwanted and unloved. And always of the last couple of weeks, I've been getting this vision in my head of my Jesus, the star of the story, 
And that vision goes something like this. After that first abuse that I remember when I was seven years old, I remember very distinctly the next morning. I've lived in Florida my whole life, and so the sun was bright. And I remember just as a seven-year-old toe-headed kid creeping down these stairs after a night of hell, basically. And I went on about my life trying to find people to want me and love me and, and provide for myself. But of late, as I've been trying to lean into the sovereignty of God in all of this, I now envision Jesus at the bottom of those stairs, kneeling down, waiting for me, frankly. And I see him there, and I'm confused and maybe don't even know who he is, but he takes my hand and puts it in his nail-scarred hands and just simply says to me, me too. Been hearing a lot of that lately in these times when I don't do such a great job of the things that I describe before on the daily. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that it definitely does. Um, in the past 20 months, obviously, it's been a, a lot for everyone. It does feel like it's trauma on top of trauma. Tell me how you've walked through that and how, um, yeah, how have you walked through that? Yeah, so everybody that we've asked this question to has responded the same. It was awful. It was horrible. It was, it was all the things. And it was awful, and it was horrible, and it was all the things. Early on in the pandemic, my livelihood was very much in jeopardy, a career that has spanned 26 years, and so there was that. But there was this 24-7 news loop of death and destruction and and bad news and, and words like, it's going to be a long, dark winter and all of the things. And I just remember especially early on in the pandemic. And I'm so grateful for Christian artists who just did these free living room concerts. And so I would just sit in that dark room in that place that I just described to you because I didn't have my community there to remind me that I was both wanted and loved. And I would just watch video after video and just sob at the sadness of it. And I was lonely and and the same thing that everybody else is. And so for twos out there, I hope that you did like I did and that somewhere along the way you managed to turn off the news and you stopped watching the sadness. And even, Chrissy, on this day that we were recording this podcast, um, there is still things going on out there that Enneagram twos need to basically not know about. I, I leaned a lot on my community to tell me if there was a hurricane coming or something, because as a type two, watching the numbers trickle up every day on the news of people dying, it just that part of the type two who just wants to help. I remember just thinking, I want to clean out my pantry and take it to people who can't have it or domestic violence skyrocketed by by double digits. Kids weren't being fed, abused kids weren't being reported. And all of that stuff was atrocious for a type two because there was nothing, absolutely nothing that we could do, nothing that we could do. And so it was awful. It was horrible. But it was an opportunity for me to realize the sovereignty of God and that he had it and that he could do so much more than I could for these people as he continues to. But it was a rough go. It was it was an absolute rough go. Yeah, I. it was... It was hard to be there with you, and I, I understand better now that I understand your Enneagram type, how the news, the world affected you so much, and of course being really the opposite of you. I, I thrive in intense situations, so I was to some degree living my best life, <laughs> and and. They say that Enneagram 6 have been preparing their whole lives for, for, for that. And it's kind of true. So, And I'm an introvert. And so all of it, uh, it was so hard for me to really dig in and understand the depth of how hard it was for you. Not that it was a 
cakewalk for me, but it was completely different. Our experiences were just so vastly different. And that is where really understanding one another and trying to come alongside and not make you two a six and not make a six a two or any of us. You know what I mean? And again, we aren't our type. We aren't our Enneagram type only, but I do want to really say allow the people in your life to thrive in who they are and help them. So when you would get into your deep, dark cave for too long, I could come in and say, hey, we are safe now. You and I are standing here in our little neck of the woods alive. And that is good. And so let's focus here for a moment just to get you out of your head. And then you would help me see the world. And so, so it's good for us to be in community. Yeah, and I, I don't think we can overstress that on this podcast. I mean, it just seems to be the central theme. So twos out there, if you're still feeling that pandemic empathy overload, I would strongly encourage you to get someone different from you to pull you out of it and to encourage you that God is still on the throne. He's still sovereign. Yes, it's sad. And so what I have found, Chrissy, is that the best thing I can do at this point, because pretty soon we're going to be talking about, and maybe even by the time this airs, we'll be upwards of 22 months-ish. And so this doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. And so we, it is really important for all of us to help each other, because when we get to your interview, there were ways I was able to help you. And so that's how um, the pandemic has been for this Enneagram 2 anyway. So I'd like to kind of wrap up with the question we ask everyone. What would you like the world, your friends, your family to know about the twos, about how can we help you guys thrive? And I'm going to assume trauma here. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to start with my friends and my family, the people that I'm closest to, how you can help me thrive. If you just give us a little bit of grace and understand that we experience the world through all the feels. Our center of intelligence is our heart. And so if you just be patient with us and realize that we are going to respond to the, 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 the pain of other people, we're going to respond very differently than other people will practically. Chrissy, you're a very practical person, and so like you said, you're able to go into go mode. But I think if my friends and family would look at me and view me as just someone that was made this way and 100% wants to live in, in the framework of how God made me, I think that for my friends and family, if you just keep reminding me that I am loved for who I am and not for what I do, it's easy when when people are saying nice things about you or you just happen to have a skill set that that the world really appreciates, it's easy to get my value tied up in that. And so sometimes I just need people to say, just like Mama Gowan did that time when I was 15, has anybody told you today? Has anybody told you today that they love you? Please don't assume that we know you love us just because of the way you treat us. Sometimes we need to hear the words. I saw something the other day, get so used to telling people, your friends, that you love them, particularly when you get off the phone with them, that it's not weird anymore. And so I think I can speak for all Enneagram 2s out there when I say we need to hear you say that you love us. And then finally, if you would take a little bit of steps towards us when we are on empathy overload and maybe even help us say, well, practically what can you do to help in that situation? And we may end up at there's nothing we can do to help. But just talking through it, twos are very huge. I thought this was just a me thing, but it's not the more research I do. Twos are huge verbal processors. And so sometimes we just need to talk. And I tend to I tend to attract introverts. And so sometimes that's that's hard for some of my closest friends. But sometimes we just need to talk things through. We're verbally processors. 
And I would just say love us well, especially in the presence of trauma. I know that it's hard to do life, and I'm speaking to you particularly, Chrissy, with someone with the body of trauma that I have, but sometimes we just need to know that we are the precious daughter of the Most High God because we got up in that morning and we breathed air. And so I hope that answers your question. We just we need you to step in our direction a little bit and understand that we're not just people that want to be sad all the time or that just want to take on the problems of the world. But we are empathetic, we feel deeply, and we need to be reminded that we're loved. And sometimes we just need to hear those words. Yeah, I feel like one of the common themes when we ask this question is kind of a a love us in our broken places and love us in the, in the good too. Like I I think that um, recognizing that you have a real superpower. Like we've talked about that a couple of times with different, with different guests is you, each of us has kind of a little superpower and uh, allowing you to be that person who is really empathetic and sees the world and not push it down and not tell you to be different than who you are. And you are a helper and allow you to help instead of saying, Oh no, 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 we've got this. But just being that safe place where you can be you and, and loved well. Yeah. I think that's a good word and a great example of that. I remember one time asking you, you're about 30 feet from me and I was literally standing at the coffee machine and I said, Hey, can I bring you a coffee? No, I'm good. I'll get up and get it. And I looked at you and was like, can I bring you coffee? And I was like, you got this realization that (laughs) you got, you got this realization that, Oh, she, this is, this is how she tells me she loves me is by helping. And so I think that's a really great point is let us help. But then also the committee of you that is my friends and my community step in and say, there's nothing more you can do here except for take it to the star of the story. Amen to that. All right. Well, are you done interviewing me? Because this has been a little terrifying. (laughs) You did really good. Well, thank you. And and thank you guys for listening. And I hope that Enneagram Type 2s out there has found a little special encouragement in this episode. You can find a little bit more about my journey as an Enneagram 2 and my Enneagram coaching with Carissa Harrison in the season finale of season 2. And that'll be in the show notes. And so thank you. We'll be back in two weeks with Enneagram Type 3. And you will have to wait to find out who that guest is. But we will be back here in the Healing Zone. And until then, just remember what we always say. You are seen. You are known. You are heard. You are loved. And you are valued. Hey guys, thank you so much for spending time with us. I always say it, time is something that we're not making more of. This was an interesting episode to do as I literally was on the other side of the mic. I hope that you gained something from it, especially those of you who are Enneagram 2s or those of you who love us. Don't forget to head over to the Patreon account, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, and listen to AC Chat. That is free content. And it is just something that we wanted to do for the listeners, especially during the Enneagram series. So until two weeks when we see you back here in the healing zone, you know what I'm going to say. You are seen, you are known, you are heard, you are loved, and you are valued. Let my life glorify you and teach me to walk beside you. I want to be more like you. Let my